bad we can be to become how good we can be. I'll speak this in three broad parts. So, after each part, if it is possible, then I would invite you to make some comments or ask some questions also. The three parts I'll speak is, first is that good and evil are co-eternal with existence. Second is that we are products of our past but not prisoners of our past. And <coughs> Bhakti can raise us above our past. I think that these three points I'll speak. So here the first point is good and evil are co-eternal with creation. So here in this fourth canto of Bhagavatam the outline of how the universe came about is given and this starts from the third canto where the process of creation is being described and Bhagavatam spends a lot of time on the first month that is Swayamdhu. So here he and his various descendants are being described and this actually the descendants of Swayamdhu Manu and the narration goes on till the 8th canto. And then the 8th canto there is a fast forward covering 7 Manus and then the Vaivasuk Manu and what is happening during the Vaivasuk Manu, the appearance of Krishna which is which happened in this particular Svalkalpa that is described also. So here <coughs> while going along with the story of these various descendants one point that comes up is the description of the various descendants who are evil. There are multiple levels to the universe and multiple different kinds of beings exist at different levels as described in the Bhagavatam. And here Shri Prabhupada writes in the purport that how with the combination of good and evil that that that, that, that Brahmaji not only produced virtuous sons like Sanat, Sanat and Narada but also Nirutti, Adharma, Dambha and falsity so falsehood, uh, hypocrisy, irreligiosity all these were also produced the thinkers throughout history have pondered the nature of the creation and especially the nature of the human person each one of us has our own good or bad and this potential where does it come from as it is said that there are some people who are wise and some people are otherwise so <coughs> we could put it as the divine and demoniac nature which Krishna talks about and it is interesting that Krishna says that abhijatasya that this is the nature we are born with. So Prabhupada explains in the purport that creation is cyclic and therefore where we ended in our previous life we begin in the next life and where we ended in a previous uh, universal manifestation even if the universe gets uh, destroyed in the next universal manifestation we begin over there, begin from there. So that now in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam it is described how Brahmaji, how Narada became, Narada boy became the Saint Narada. So it is described that he lived on after becoming detached, after the death of his mother, he went northwards and sat in meditation, he had a darshan of Vishnu and then uh, of the Lord and then he, the Lord disappeared and he continued his penances till eventually he left his body and then in the next manifestation he became Narada. So the idea is that he had attained an exalted level of purity and then he manifested as the great soul Narada in a subsequent life. So all of us have histories that go far far beyond what our knowledge can, our knowledge systems can know. Nowadays with uh, <coughs> immigration being a big concern, the immigration, uh, the governments want to know 
what is the past history of a person now, has this person got any criminal record has this person been involved in any kind of violence before so they with people's history is preserved uh, quite carefully and people who want to cover their tracks they try to cover their history but even if somebody has a spotless history in this lifetime that doesn't mean that they are spotless our history exists far beyond this life and when it is said that good and evil are co-eternal with creation now when it is said brahma had good sons as well as bad sons like this that doesn't mean that god wants to create evil rather we are all given free will and the very necessity of free will is because only with free will is love possible if a boy proposes to a girl and the girl says no and the boy takes a gun at her head and says if you don't love me i'll shoot you and even if the girl says yes that's not love so love requires free will and free will has no meaning without the arena for the exercise of free will that without there being a possibility to exercise the free will the way one wants free will itself doesn't have much meaning so that exercise of free will requires a world where people can choose to act virtuously and people can choose to act viciously so just as the there are higher beings the gods who can facilitate us uh, if we want to live virtuously and there are lower beings also who can facilitate us if we want to live viciously in the mahabharata it is described that duryodhan was empowered by the daityas right the daityas wanted to daityas are demoniac beings and they wanted to take over the earth for taking over the earth they performed austerities and got one of them to be born in the human ruling dynasty this is the example of what today language will be called as womb warfare that means enemies can infiltrate in different ways into another kingdom so the demoniac beings infiltrate into earth even through womb so of course the gods also infiltrated the pandavas were godly beings the kauravas were ungodly beings previously so when we say good and evil is there on the earth from the beginning what it essentially means is that souls with good and bad facilities good good and god good and bad mentalities need to be facilitated and for facilitating them there has to be a certain amount of empowerment for whatever they want to do now generally we use the word empowerment in a positive sense but there can be empowerment in all the three modes the satvik empowerment rajasik empowerment tamasik empowerment so somebody who comes up as some researcher who comes with a making up how to make a nuclear weapon it requires great intelligence to make that but its intelligence used for a greatly destructive purpose so there can be empowerment in tamas tamoguna in the mode of ignorance which is very destructive and there can be empowerment satvoguna which is constructive and there can be empowerment in transcendence which is hugely which is ultimately liberating so whenever anybody is able to do anything extraordinary the bhagavad gita 10 chapter describes that it is a vibhuti of krishna vibhuti opulence of krishna now one way to understand vibhuti is that the one above the many manifests as one among the many the one above the many is the supreme lord but he manifests as one among them and he that means some extraordinary power in this world which somebody has that person appears to be like another human being but there is something higher which is manifesting through them when hanuman first saw ravan in his royal court hanuman's first thought was this person is so powerful this person is so so skilled so skilled at warfare if only he had been virtuous he would have been a great protector of dharma he would be a protector even of the gods so he saw the potential for good even in a person who was evil the point i'm making here is that <clears throat> like just like ravan was empowered by the blessings of the gods 
but that empowerment he used for terrible purposes. So, empowerment itself can be of different kinds and depending on people's mentality they may use it differently. So, good and evil exist, coexist from the beginning of creation as is described over here because living beings with good and evil mentalities also exist from the beginning of creation having got their mentalities from their past history and the world is a reflection of the mentality of people broadly speaking depending on the kind of mentality people have that is how the, the culture the world gets shaped broadly speaking. So, <clears throat> I was I just came from Australia yesterday. So, in Melbourne I was asked a question that that <clears throat> now why is it so easy to do bad things and why is it so difficult to do good things? Why are the uh, bad options so many and the good options so few? So, I explained that that is how always it is in any multiple choice exam. In a multiple choice exam the wrong options will probably say out of 5 choices 4 will be wrong and 1 will be right. Now, <coughs> all the options have come from the teacher, but that does not make the teacher responsible for the failure of the student. In the Vishnu Sahasranam, Kamada Kamya, there are one Kamaha Kamada Kamya, it is described where various names of Vishnu are given. So, it says the Kamada and Kamaha that he is the fulfiller of desire he and he is also the destroyer of desire and he is also the supreme desirable being. This is a beautiful way of analyzing that he is the fulfiller of desire in the sense that it is the teacher only who gives all the options. So, all the options come from the teacher. So, all choices all the worldly objects all the various options that exist in the world they come from Krishna. But everything, although everything attractive comes from Krishna, everything attractive does not take us to Krishna. So, just like all the options come from the teacher, but all the options do not take one to the teacher. You could say they take one, but not in a happy sense, the teacher will punish if the wrong option is chosen. So, the wrong options are there in this world because we ourselves have desires to act in undesirable ways, in evil ways and the world facilitates that, but the world also in the world tradition there are also scriptures given there is God given guidance from within and without by which we can make the right choice. So, the Bhagavatam uh, reveals through as Dhruva Maharaj's pastime which will be told soon how Dhruva he ultimately made the choice of, of Vishnu as his as a supreme desirable choice even when he had the facility to choose a flourishing kingdom which is what he had wanted, but he chose chose a king chose Vishnu. So, that is what is described in this particular section that the good and evil coexist from the beginning of creation and it is up to us and they exist because they that is that facilitates our particular desires for good or evil. <coughs> So, any questions or comments about this? Is it as I said I will speak three points and after each point we can have some comments or questions. So, should I go ahead? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But now, if somebody is chosen to be a devotee, can they still choose to be wrong? See, when we say chosen to be a devotee, that simply means that they are chosen 
to have the opportunity to become a devotee. Say, it is not that anybody can be forced to become a devotee. There are broadly, we could say, two ways. Of course, specifics can be multiple, but there are probably two ways we can say that somebody comes to bhakti. One is they have practiced some bhakti in a previous life and the other is that they haven't practiced any bhakti. So, Vishwanath Chakra Thakur in his Sarat Darshini, no, in his uh, Madhuri Kadambini talks about this that Shraddha, faith can be of two types, Swabhaviki and Balen Utpadita. Swabhaviki is natural. So, that means he refers to somebody who has practiced spirit, some kind of spirituality in their previous lives and therefore, they are naturally attracted towards transcendence. Krishna talks about this in 6.43 and 44 when he says, Purva Bhyasena Tenaiva Riyate Yava Shopisaha. So, by previous practice, almost like helplessly Riyate, they feel attracted, Avasho. So, even if they are having a normal happy life, but still they want something more and they start to go, go exploring and then they find something. So, they are, they are almost pulled towards transcendence. So, that is how, that is in one sense we could say that they are chosen in the sense that there is a force uh, beyond themselves that grips them and pulls them towards transcendence. The second sense of chosen could be that somehow devotees come in the life of such a person even if they do not have much spiritual interest and simply by the association of devotees and the powerful influence thereby that person gets an opportunity to practice bhakti. And Prabhupada quotes the famous verse from Chaitanya Charitamrit, Brahmanda Brahmite Kona Bhagyavana Jeev, Guru Krishna Prasade Pai Bhakti Lata Beej. That Brahmanda, that all of us are wandering in this uh, vast universe and those who are fortunate get the seed of devotion, of the seed of the creeper of devotion. And there he says in a lecture that actually it is the devotee's business to make people bhagyavan. It is the devotee's business to make the unfortunate fortunate. That means even if people have no pious credit, no spiritual practice from the past, no spiritual inclination also still, simply by the association of a devotee, uh, they might get so attracted to a devotee that they start developing a spiritual inclination. So, this is we could say balen utpadita, by the force of association some attraction is kindled in people. So, in general those who have who have practiced spiritual life in the past, when so we could say, so both these categories we could say we are, they are chosen, uh, in uh, but in a different sense. So one is there is a irresistible attraction which even they themselves cannot explain and second is some, some forceful association is, transforms them. <coughs> so, even but even then Krishna says that, that even if somebody has previous practice, still in this life also they have to practice rigorously. So, in, in 6.45 he says, Prayatna adhyata manastu yogi sam shuddha kilvishaha aneka janma sam siddhas toyati param gatim. Then the, he says, the yogi practices determinedly and becomes purified and in this way the multi-life spiritual evolution attains its culmination in liberation. So, there has to be rigorous practice even if one has practice from a previous life or no practice from a previous life. So, that rigorous practice means we have to choose Krishna, choose transcendence in this life and if we do not choose Krishna, then we will be, we will gravitate towards Maya because that is the force of the world. So, uh, the free will is never taken away. So, we could say that for many people, especially if they live in a very materialistic society, the only options for them might be Rajasik and Tamasik, with Sattva not being much of an option at all or it will be like a very small option. And Bhakti for people who are born in a very godless environment, Bhakti is not an option at all because they do not come to know about Krishna. But for some people, when we say that Bhakti is an option and they take that option, but it is not that we can, it is an option that we have to keep taking constantly. Like a choice we have to keep making on a daily basis, we could say even on a moment to moment basis we have to choose Krishna and not Maya. So, we may choose Krishna as a, 
as a life option and that we dedicate our life to Krishna, but even after choosing Krishna as something we dedicate our life to, but on the moment to moment basis, on hour to hour basis, day to day basis, we might choose still choose something other than Krishna and to that extent we will get, we may get deviated. So, the free will is never taken away. Does it address the question? Okay. Thank you. So, let me move on to the past now. Second point. The first point I spoke was that good and evil <coughs> are both uh, co-eternal with creation. And the second point, second point I am going to make, I was going to make second point is that we are products of our past but we are not prisoners of our past. Most of us know a little bit about ourselves, but there is much about ourselves that we do not know. And <clears throat> if we look from a material perspective and look at the vastness of nature, we human beings are the most complicated beings that are known to humanity with its current ways of knowing. Now, among our brains are the most complex <coughs> and beyond that are our minds. Science cannot even, empirical science cannot even perceive what the mind is, uh, what to speak of beyond the mind if something is there or not. So, we ourselves are very complicated beings, consciousness is still an extremely elusive concept for people to understand, for even the best brains to understand. The reason I am saying all this is that, that within, uh, we are, when we say we are very complicated beings means within us there are multiple forces that are present and these different forces come for, uh, they become forceful at different times. And that is why it is often difficult for us to behave consistently in the same manner. And now, to understand this, let us take an example, say that there is a, there is a, there is a some kind of house or a cellar and <clears throat> say there are some criminals or some uh, fugitive, some uh, hostages who are there inside. So, there is a criminal who has taken some people as hostage and they are all in a house which is completely closed. Now, there is only some kind of speaking system through which the police outside can talk with the people inside. Now, sometimes the criminals, they are speaking from inside. And sometimes, for some time, the hostages, they can push aside the criminals and they speak. Now, from the outside perspective, we have only, there is only the voice coming out from inside. And sometimes, that voice may seem very conciliatory, very eager for reconciliation. Yes, please rescue us from here, we want to come out, please help us. And the other times, the voice coming from inside may be, you know, unless you let us go, give us a free passage, we want to go our way, we will destroy, we will destroy what is inside, we will destroy what is outside. So, now the police, unless they understand this dynamic, that there are both hostages and criminals and say abductors inside, they may just get completely confused, why is this, why are these different voices speaking in such different tones with different intentions? So, so, similarly, we could say that we are like that house and inside us there are different voices. There is broadly speaking our higher side and our lower side. And we may with our higher side make a commitment to practice spiritual life, may come make a commitment to be virtuous. But sometimes even without our conscious awareness, our lower side may start speaking or lower side may start acting and then sometimes people get shocked. How could he have done like this? How could she have spoken like that? How can a devotee do like that? Right. 
the thing is that even when we become devotees, our devotion is only one voice within us and the other voices don't go away. The other voices still remain. So that means that sometimes the voice of lust, sometimes the voice of greed, sometimes the voice of anger, they might come forth. And when they come forth, at that time, at uh, that time, we might behave completely out of characteristic with our nor normal behavior or what we think of is our normal behavior. And thus, we may end up acting uh, in very contrary ways. Sometimes our lust or our anger or our greed can make us unrecognizable, not just to people around us, but even to ourselves. That's why we sometimes could I do that? What made me do that? In fact, that is Arjuna's question in 3.36 in the Bhagavad Gita when he says, Atakena prayuktoyam papam charati purushaha anichyanna pi varshneya baladivani yojitaha. What impels one to wrong actions? Uh, as Almost as if by force and against one's own desire. So, Krishna described that it is karma. Uh, now, when he uses the word karma or lust, he uses it not just in a specific sense of sexual attraction, he uses it in a generic sense of any kind of self destructive desire. The desire which makes us act against our own better intentions and against our better intelligence. So, we have this multiplicity of, we could say, voices inside us, uh, and sometimes we might end up behaving in terribly wrong ways. So, we have to, in that sense, I, the title of this talk was that we have to understand, we have to confront how bad we can be, so that we can become how good we can be. That means that we, if we just uh, let the voices within us get a free rein, we might end up doing things which we would never have thought that we would do. So, all of us are capable of, uh, capable of grievous evils also. If you look at the history of the 20th century, uh, from the historical perspective, it was the bloodiest century known in human history especially recent history. So, more people were killed in that last century than were killed in wars throughout the previous 19 centuries. One reason of course was technology which enabled weapons of mass destruction, but that was just one factor. Another was more than technology, it was ideology coupled with technology. Whether it was a Nazi ideology which killed about anything between 12 million people or more or whether it was the communist ideology <coughs> which led to over a hundred million corpses in Russia, China and other places. The point was that people did unspeakable evil. It is uh, not just murder itself is bad. But cold blooded murder is systematically planned and people are subjected to heartless kinds of agon, uh, pain. So, where it is pain is systematically planned and brutally executed, that how did people come to do something like that? We could say that people are so influenceable by ideology. But it is not just one person's charismatic influence, of course, a devilishly charismatic influence that, that did that. But basically, there were many people who just went along with it. Okay, this is, this is what is happening in society. Let's, they either consented passively or they, uh, they consented actively, you could say. They, they conspired actively. But, well, you know, if we hear say how the Nazi guards 
did horrendous things to the Jews during the Holocaust. We may, may think this is inhuman. How can anyone do that? But actually, the forces of illusion attack incrementally. They don't just take over suddenly. It is a, like a, sometimes uh, by installments, we have to pay for something. We might be paying a million dollars, but you have to pay say a thousand dollars or a, a few thousand dollars a month. And we can, we can pay that, so we, a million dollars doesn't seem to be much, we can pay like that. But similarly, by installment, the forces of illusion take over our consciousness. And then, at the end of that installment, you know, we might never intend to pay one million dollars for something, but we end up paying a million dollars. So like that, as Maya incrementally takes over our consciousness, <coughs> eventually we may end up doing things which we thought we would never do. So there are dark forces inside us and if we listen to them, if we give in to them, incrementally we start doing darker and darker things till we end up doing, uh, doing things which we would never have thought we would have done. So we have to, in that sense, take ourselves seriously. Take ourselves seriously means that we are capable of uh, doing serious harm. It's they suppose somebody has a has an automatic gun nowadays there's a lot of concern that people have guns and some terrible shootings can happen because of those uh, people because people are trigger happy people are crazy when as in australia the christchurch shooting that happened in, in the mosque created created outrage and shock so basically now if somebody ha owns a gun and not only they own a gun, but they are constantly carrying the gun with them. Then they have to be serious that, that, they, that if some impulse comes over them, they get angry with someone and they pick up the gun and shoot, uh, they might normally not even want to slap anyone. They might not even physically raise their hand against someone normally. But with the gun available to them, they might actually, if they give in to their impulses, they might shoot someone. And that would be horrendous, not just for everyone else, but even for themselves. So we could say that we are all uh, like that person carrying a gun, and not only a gun, but it's a loaded gun. So if our impulses come upon us, then I am, and we let them overcome us, then we can do terrible things. Of course, it's not that suddenly one day, the person is good and the per next day the person becomes bad. It's, it's external perspective, the person might be acting good and one day suddenly they act in a terrible way. But it's internally, they have been <clears throat> accommodating the forces of illusion, the dark desires within them more and more. During the Second World War, <clears throat> uh, the British Foreign Minister Chamberlain, whenever he accommodated Hitler for a long time and that's why there's a saying that Chamberlain school of thought is that you accommodate evil more and more thinking that that is how it will contain but the more we accommodate it then that evil takes us over dominates us and destroys us so if we take ourselves seriously in the sense that you know, there is there are seriously dark forces within us and they can make us act in grievously uh, grievously wrong ways then we become earnest about the task of controlling, of countering the dark forces within us and not just countering the dark forces within us but also channeling the good forces within us. So we are products of our past means that the dark forces within us are very much present and <clears throat> we are not prisoners of the past means that the dark forces don't necessarily have to take control of us. We can break free from the dark forces. But to think that there is no dark force within me, to think uh, <clears throat> that those who think that they are not prone to vice are actually the most prone to vice. Those who think that they are not vulnerable to temptation are the people who are the most vulnerable to temptation. And it's not just temptation, it can be perversity, it can be 
we don't we may not harm ourselves but we can harm others also so uh, that was the second point i was trying to make that the good and e first point was that good and evil are coeternal with creation and we if we are not guarded can end up doing far greater evil than what we would even contemplate or to speak of actually do because evil can take us over incrementally and make us act in act act in act heinously any comments or questions about this point hari krishna sorry anger okay okay so would controlling lust lead to anger and then anger is also difficult to control yeah that's true but uh, that's uh, it also depends on how we try to control it's like uh, say if there is a very strong water flow in a particular direction and then we put a wall over there we put a dam over there now the dam may check the flow of the water but if the water is not given some other channel to flow the water keeps hitting against the dam then sooner or later that dam will break and then the all that all that accumulated water will flow up and it can be far more destructive than the normal flow of water that's why at one level a dam can be a very big blessing because <clears throat> water can be channeled and utilized in various directions but if the dam breaks then it can cause far greater destruction than the normal water flow would have caused because before the dam or because 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 the dam accumulates far more water than what uh, would be would, would otherwise have been there in the river in that place so similarly for us we definitely need to create a dam so that the water of our consciousness does not flow in evil directions but then simultaneously we need to create a channel for that water to flow in another direction and that's why just uh, restraint alone is not enough we need redirection of our desires and the bhagavatam says that that the great sages sometimes they cross over the vast ocean of lust but then they fall into the puddle of anger and they sink over there that's why that they might be able to control lust but it is primarily being talked about people who are not practicing bhakti transcendentalists who by sheer will power overcome lust but because they have not channeled their energy elsewhere eventually some provocation comes they may not get angry they may not get lusty but they get angry and then they lose their tapobal the power of their austerity so <coughs> we could say that the river of our consciousness has to be channeled in a constructive direction so even as devotees if we have strongly invested ourselves in some plan some service and if that becomes thwarted then we will also feel angry but instead of simply uh, vegetating over that frustration and whatever is the cause if we can channel elsewhere okay this service didn't work out uh instead of trying to get instead of feeling resentful or revengeful towards those who blocked this service if we channel the water of our consciousness in some other direction then that resentment won't come up the prabhupad was trying tirelessly to share krishna bhakti in india but but somehow he didn't have much success and even his god brothers although they had influence 
uh, they were caught up in just in probably just maintaining their mathas, not really, they didn't have the spirit of outreach. And then Prabhupada came to America and even in America, he just wanted some help from his Indian God brothers. Just they go to the government and sanction some transfer of foreign exchange. Prabhupada himself got a donor, but his God brothers are not ready to do that also. So, when that didn't work out, Prabhupada did not become resentful of his God brothers. Prabhupada just recognized that he would have to start the Krishna consciousness movement on his own with no assistance from India whatsoever. And then he focused his efforts entirely on his uh, potential followers in America. And that's how the Krishna consciousness movement started. So for Prabhupada also, like a particular channel might be blocked, a particular pathway might be blocked completely. Now sometimes that blockage may be by our own voluntary restraint. Sometimes it might be by an external limitation that is put. But when it, whichever way the blockage comes, we cannot we cannot let the water of our consciousness keep hitting that blockage repeatedly because eventually that blockage will break. We need to simultaneously work to redirect the water of our consciousness so that once the water that is accumulated in the dam is channeled elsewhere, then its force on the dam decreases. Does it address the question? Okay, yeah, that's actually my third point that <clears throat> I'll move on to that. So, bhakti can raise us above our past. So, wh what does this mean practically? That there are in the in the qualities of a brahmana described in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, from 42 to 44, 45, Krishna talks about the qualities of the different people in the varanas, four varanas. So, he says, Shamo Damastapa Shaucham Shanti Rajavamevacha Gyanam Gyanam Vigyanam Astikyam Brahma Karma Sabhavajam. So he says Shama and Dhamma. Now Shama is translated as peace of mind, Dhamma is translated as sense control. So these are two interesting things that first is that that we do not let our mind get agitated by temptation itself. Uh, so it said that the best way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation. That means just do not put any energy on it. So we keep the mind peaceful by not dwelling on temptation itself. But if somehow temptation comes in, then Dhamma, Dhamma is sense control. And okay, the mind has got agitated, but at least I will not act at the physical level. So the mind will get agitated when there is some impure desire inside it. But if there is no impure desire inside it, then the mind will not get agitated. It says that there are two people who go by a bar and somebody, one of them is a regular alcoholic, the other has never drunk and uh, then the alcoholic might feel tempted, the, the non-alcoholic, the teetotaler will, who has never drunk may not feel tempted at all. So similarly for us. Uh, if we have never indulged in a particular desire, then there is no no uh, impression within the mind. So you could say for that particular thing, there is no evil voice inside us. Mm, so this is one way there can be purity, that there is no impurity, so there is purity naturally. But the other way is also that if we consistently keep saying no to uh, something lower, then gradually that lower voice starts getting receding so much into the background that it almost disappears. That's why I say many of us might have been eating meat before, but now if somebody tempts us with meat, most of us would not even consider taking it. We would, you know, what Yamunachari famously says that, Shishtu Nishtivanamcha, that, that when I think of sensual pleasure, my lips curl in distaste and I spit at the thought. Now we might not be able to do it for the temptations coming from lust, but at least with respect to meat, many of us might be able to just turn away from it quite effortlessly. So this means that at least with respect to that temptation of meat, 
we have got to a point of purification or a point of purity where there is no temptation at all. So, that means we could say that when the desire is there, but the determination is there, I am not going to indulge. That is where the struggle comes. So, you could say that inside us there is the desire for desire for indulgence and there is a determination for transcendence. The desire for indulgence comes from our past uh, impressions that are there and the determination for transcendence comes from our spiritual knowledge, from our spiritual association, from our spiritual commitment. And <clears throat> in the initial stages, the desire for indulgence is very strong, can be stronger than the determination for transcendence and that is why we succumb or we relapse. But with the practice of bhakti, the determination for transcendence becomes so strong that we keep repeatedly saying no to the desire for indulgence and eventually the desire for indulgence declines and disappears. So, sometime, some things may not tempt us at all and even when we expose ourselves to those things, you, uh, we feel no desire for that at all. So, that is where we could say that we have attained purity. But in general, a devotee does not uh, presume that I have become pure and a devotee does not deliberately expose oneself to temptation to check whether I have become pure or not. So, it was even when Haridas Thakur was tempted, Haridas Thakur did not go to the prostitute. The prostitute came and Haridas Thakur continued his chanting. So, a devotee does not deliberately provoke uh, the forces of illusion to check whether uh, they are dead or not. It is like say we are passing by a forest path and we see a tiger lying motionless on the ground. Now, the tiger might be asleep or the tiger might be dead. It is best that we just walk along and let the tiger do what it is doing. But suppose somebody just for the sake of checking, they go and pinch the tiger. Now, the tiger may be dead and nothing may happen, but the tiger may be awake and then, then we will be dead. So, it is best not to pinch a sleeping tiger. So, it is best not to put ourselves in provoking situation just to check whether we have gone beyond provocation. But if sometimes life puts us in provoking situations and we find that we are not provoked, that could be a good indication that we have attained a purity uh, beyond return. It is like say a satellite wants to take off from the earth and as long as the satellite is within the gravity pull of the earth, the satellite will be pulled. But it eventually the satellite can go beyond the earth's gravity pull and then the satellite does not need that conscious acceleration to move on. Con, uh, the fuel expenditure is not so much required because there is no gravity pulling it down. So, that is how when we come to from Vaidhi Bhakti to Raganuga Bhakti from spontaneous uh, from conscientious devotion to spontaneous devotion. So, in conscientious, conscientious devotion we the desire for indulgence has to be conscientiously rejected and the determination for transcendence has to be consciously cultivated. But in the but uh, once we get to the point out of once we get out of the gravity pull of a sense object, then that determination is no longer required to resist because the gravity pull is no longer there. So, yes, by the gradual practice of bhakti, we will attain uh, uh, the dark forces within us will decline and disappear. So, that is our ultimate. So, this was the last point I was going to make that that is our supreme hope that if you keep practicing bhakti by the practice steady practice of bhakti our attraction to Krishna will increase and as our attraction to Krishna increases then our attachment to worldly things starts decreasing and, and that is why in bhakti the focus has to be more on connecting with Krishna than on disconnecting with illusion. In the Bhagavad Gita's 7th chapter, there is a dramatic shift in tone, whereas till the six, first 6 chapters Krishna is repeatedly talking about virakti, being detached, being equipoised, not getting carried away by happiness or distress, learning to detach oneself from the sense objects. The 7th chapter, the very first verse and the first words 
of the first verse begin with a very different theme. Maya Saktamanaha Partha. Krishna says, Mai Asaktamanaha. That make your mind attached to me. So, what that means is, Krishna is now talking about not so much about detaching ourselves from, from temptation and illusion, but attaching ourselves to Krishna. So, bhakti is centered more on taking up spiritual desires than on giving up material desires. Sometimes the, the struggle to give up something can be quite tiring. Because whenever we give up something, there is a sense of deprivation that comes because of that. Oh, <coughs> I, I am losing this. But when we take up, a sense of connection comes up. So even if we have some desire that we are not able to give up, we don't become disheartened by that. We focus on taking up service for Krishna, connecting with Krishna. Prabhupada's greatest qualification uh, was not that he was the most scholarly among his god brothers. There were others who had a whole lifetime to study. Prabhupada had his household responsibilities. He did study, he was very learned, no doubt. And it's amazing how despite having a family and a business, Prabhupada was able to study so much scripture and quote so much scripture. But he did not have that luxury of a, a life devoted to scriptural study alone. So there were others who might be more, might have been more scholarly than him. But Prabhupada's uh, greatest qualification was that he had the strongest desire to share the share Krishna Bhakti across the world. And it was not his scholarship, but it is it was his spiritual desire that uh, that took him across the world on preaching missions. So similarly, we focus not so much on giving up the connection with illusion as taking up a connection with Krishna. So, <clears throat> we conclude with this point that even if we can't resist our urges, we can persist between our urges. That means if we consider a graph of say time versus uh, temptation, our, that, that we may not feel constantly tempted by lust or anger or greed or envy or whatever, but sometimes that graph shoots up, the, the desire suddenly surges up and when it surges, at that time it may be almost impossible to resist. Actually even when it surges, <clears throat> it is not going to grow infinitely. It's like say the Hawaii, we are in Hawaii, it's a here there is beach and people go surfing. Now when they are surfing, actually when a wave rises, if one can surf with the wave, one goes up with the wave and then one comes down with the wave. Then the wave does not hit the person because the person is going up and coming down with the wave. So our desires, our urges we could say, lower urges, they are also like waves. When it is rising, sometimes we feel this is so strong. How long can I resist it? Even if I resist it now, eventually it is going to be there, it is going to grow stronger and it is going to overpower me. But the desire, the urges do not grow like an infinitely growing line or infinitely rising line. The urges grow like waves. And just as a wave has its crest and then it has its trough. So similarly, <coughs> our urges when they are growing, they may seem to be irresistible, but they are not going to grow infinitely they will hit a peak and then they will go down. So if we resist the till they hit their peak, then eventually they will go down. But still, if suppose when the urges rise very strongly and we are not able to resist them, at that time we might feel disheartened. Oh, I succumbed over there. But the important thing is that the, what do we do in between the urges? Even if we can't resist the urges, we can persist between the urges. That means, okay, during this urge this happened, but immediately after that, I take up my practice of bhakti wholeheartedly and if we have some committed services, if we are committed to our sadhana, if we have, if we have taken up some spiritual desires, then that spiritual desire will what will fill out the space between the urges and because through that spiritual desire we are connecting with Krishna, we are getting purified. And next time when the urge hits us, we will be better equipped to resist it. And even if we do not succeed next time, 
but instead of simply beating ourselves up for having succumbed to the urge, if we focus not so much on giving up that worldly desire, but taking up a spiritual desire, then that taking up a spiritual desire, we can do in between the urges and through that connection we become purified and eventually by that purification we will be strong, we'll become strong enough to resist the urge, which too will become weaker over time if we are connecting ourselves with Krishna and thus we can overcome our lower side by persisting in bhakti even if we are not succeeding in resisting our urges. So, thus I will summarize, I spoke on we have to confront how bad we can be so that we can become as good as we can be. I spoke three points, first was that evil, that good and evil are co-eternal with creation, I talked about how Brahma when he creates there are saintly sons and there are also vicious qualities that arise as is described in his fourth canto. So, <clears throat> good and evil, the world is a arena for us to exercise our free will and by our free will because we have lower desires, so there has to be facilitation for those lower desires also. So, good and evil paths are there in this world to facilitate souls who have good and evil propensities from their previous lives. So, it is like a teacher giving a multiple choice exam, all the options come from the teacher, but it is not the teacher wants us to choose all the options. So, everything attractive comes from Krishna, but everything attractive does not take us to Krishna. Krishna tells us to which attractive thing we should become attracted, so that we can come to him, that is where scriptural guidance comes up. So, uh, the second point I talked about was that you know, there is a dark side within us, if we do not restrain it, it can it can make us do terrible things. We are products of our past, although we are not its prisoners. So, <clears throat> temptation and evil, they take our consciousness on an incremental installment basis and that is why it is not so noticeable that we huge huge areas deposits of our, our consciousness are going into illusion till suddenly some terrible action happens and then people ask or we ask and ask how did I do that. So, we are very complicated beings in the sense that we are like a closed house with multiple voices inside us. So, if hostages as well as the abductors are there, the outside police cannot make out who is speaking at a particular time and so wildly contradictory voices might come in. So, we are like that house and within us there is virtue and there is vice also and if we are not guarded then vice may take us over and with technology now giving us access to far greater power than what we had in the recent past. We see the last century there were more deaths than in all the previous 90 centuries combined together. That is because people had a dark side and the dark ideologies compiled with technology facilitated people to people's dark side to come out in, in horrendous ways. So, for us we need to recognize that we are like a loaded, loaded, gun, loaded automatic gun. If we do not take ourselves seriously, then we can we can seriously we can do seriously terrible things, but if we take ourselves seriously then we can bring out the good within us and for that I talked about the third point, how bhakti can help us to rise above our past, that there is there is a regulation and there is purification. Regulation means that the mind gets agitated, but still with at a sensory level we maintain control and purification means the mind itself does not get agitated like somebody who has never drunk alcohol does not feel agitated near a bar or somebody who has given up alcohol for such a long time that again when going by a bar they do not feel agitated. So, for us if we keep practicing bhakti steadily then <coughs> we will become purified that means that the temptations will no longer tempt us just like a satellite goes out of the gravity pull of the earth then it does not have to <coughs> exercise that same, so much fuel does not have to expend it to just keep moving. So, similarly when we become pure enough that there are no worldly impressions left, 
then we can move from conscientious devotion to spontaneous devotion. So we may not at all feel tempted by meat, although we might have been eating it before. That indicates that bhakti does purify us and we can attain a point of purity beyond return. But while that may happen with meat, that may not happen with other temptations. And it's best that we don't ourselves put ourselves in provocative situations to check whether we get provoked or not. That's like pinching a sleeping tiger. It's best to just walk by the tiger without checking whether it is dead or sleeping. So similarly, we try to avoid provoking situations as much as possible. Those who think that they are not vulnerable to vice are probably the most vulnerable to vice. But so if we focus on bhakti centers on taking up bhakti, taking up spiritual desires, not on giving up worldly desires. Prabhupada's greatest qualification was not just his renunciation or his scholarship, but it was his burning desire to share Krishna Bhakti with the world. And uh, for us, uh, uh, even if we can't resist our urges, we can persist between our urges. When our urges start rising within us, we may feel that this is so strong and it will keep going stronger. How can I resist it? So you may think that it is it's like an infinitely rising line, but it is actually like a uh, like a rising wave which will fall. It will like an eternally recurring wave, but it is not a rising constant eternally rising wave. So if you can surf the surf the wave of our urge, then it will decrease and we may not have to succumb to it also. But even if we somehow succumb to it, instead of centering our devotion simply on resisting our urges. We can center our devotion on persisting between our urges. Okay, that thing happened, but now I want to practice bhakti wholeheartedly. And if during the in the in the period between the urges, if we are taking up a serious service, a serious commitment to Krishna, then that connection will purify us gradually, increasingly, till we become better equipped to not only resist the urges, but eventually even transcend the urges. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yeah, beautiful. Both ways it's true. 
our meditation protects us from our lower side, but then over a period of time, our chanting also it itself becomes joyful. So, once it becomes joyful, then we do it not because we have to, but because we love to do it. So, both ways are there. Sometimes, when we do not love to do it, we recognize, we motivate ourselves by knowing that I have to do it, this is my medication medicine. But there are times when we love to do it, we do it because it gives us so much joy. Thank you for sharing that too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So where does our dark side come from? Even if somebody wants to enjoy separate from Krishna, why can't we just enjoy without really succumbing to dark desires? See, the nature of nature of the soul is that the soul wants pleasure. And we just do not want pleasure, we want unending pleasure, we want increasing pleasure. And Krishna has glories which are unending and as our attraction to him increases, then we can get increasing joy in that. But uh, a soul who is seeking pleasure away from Krishna, because we are driven by the desire for unending increasing pleasure, so when something promises us a pleasure but does not deliver that deliver as much pleasure as we thought we would get, then we seek more and more and more. Uh, somebody say eat some food, now eating is necessary for nutrition, eating is necessary for um, bodily maintenance and eating is also an activity of pleasure, we, we like to eat good food. But, so in eating there is, there is both nutrition and satisfaction combined, but if somebody separates the two and seeks only the pleasure, then they will go down a track where they will eat more and more unhealthy food, till the food that they eat starts becoming like poison, and poison they are taking which is going to kill them sooner or later. So, we all want pleasure and whatever, uh, if our life does not have some purpose higher than simply seeking pleasure, then in the pursuit of pleasure, we start um, crossing all boundaries, whether it be of like, even if somebody does not believe in ethics with respect to eating, but still even boundaries of common sense and intelligence. I was in Australia and I met a doctor, this doctor was told that he was called to an emergency ward once and what happened? So, there was this person who had eaten so many chicken that his whole alimentary canal had become filled with chicken, like dozens and dozens of chicken he had eaten and he said, Actually, I had to anesthetize that person and open his mouth and like put a prong inside, put a, put a, put my finger or put some device inside his throat and literally pick out chicken from there which he had eaten. So, I said that is ridiculous, how can somebody eat like that? But just that sometimes if, if, the, des if the desire for pleasure can grip us so much that in seeking more and more pleasure, 
you might just keep doing more and more da darker things. So, like nowadays with respect to the internet, somebody starts surfing and you can surf for pleasure, reading something good and getting some pleasure also over there. But from there, we can start surfing more and more uh, inappropriate things. So, when that urge comes up, people start surfing with more frequency, with greater duration and with increasing uh, perversity. So, that surfing can degrade more and more because the pleasure is, yes, if, if the search for pleasure becomes uh, divorced from some higher purpose, then that surf search for pleasure can easily degrade us. So, our dark side, it is not that Krishna has given it to us, it is just that our search for pleasure, if it is not, it is not connected with some higher purpose, then that search for pleasure can degrade us. And then what happens is that if the search for pleasure is frustrated, <clears throat> then so not only the search for pleasure can degrade us, but the obstruction in the search for pleasure can also degrade us, like it said lust leads to anger. So, anger, resentment is also a form of anger and so for example, the, the Germans after the first world war, they believed that, they not only believed, it was true that the treaty of Versailles was after the first world was very humiliating and they were resentful about what had happened and how their economy had tanked and they were in great distress. And somehow Hitler came along and created a story that the Jews are responsible for your distress. So, and then they just directed all their wrath towards the Jews. So, when the, when, the, when, the, when the search for pleasure becomes, the, becomes our sole driving motive in life without any higher purpose, then the search for pleasure itself can degrade us or the obstacle in that search for pleasure can also rationalize us in doing whatever it takes to remove that obstacle. So, in that case also we might do dark things. So, that darkness is we could say a not a result of uh, anything Krishna has done, but it is a result of the divorce of our search for pleasure from a higher purpose in life. It is a people who devote themselves to some higher purpose, say some even not necessarily a devotional service, but even some uh, humanitarian cause, some literature, some art, their search for pleasure may not bring out the dark side within them. So, they might just write more, draw more, paint more or whatever, but if, the, if pleasure becomes the sole driving purpose. In bhakti, it is not pleasure that is our driving purpose, it is service that is our driving purpose <coughs> and pleasure <coughs> is a byproduct of that service. But if pleasure becomes the driving purpose, then it can bring out the dark side within us uh, both ways through the in the very search for pleasure or within the because of the obstacles in that search for pleasure and that is how we might uh, that darkness will manifest. So, Prabhu, it's seven. Thank you very much. It's seven thirty. Should we stop here, Prabhu? It's yeah. Okay, let me see this. Okay, I'm seeing it right now. Yeah, I am reading the question, just a minute, but it is it, it, just a comment, is there a question? Anarthas can sometimes be, be very overwhelming. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, that is true. Yes, thank you. Actually, I write on the Bhagavad Gita every day at my website gitadaily.com. So, one thing I say is that one article I wrote over there is that we may fall down, but we do not have to fall away. 
So, fall down is when our urges overcome us, but fall away is when we stop persisting in bhakti, when we give up bhakti itself. So, we may fall down, but we do not have to fall away. So, because if we center our center our bhakti. Okay, is it better now? Okay, so all that I said was that we may fall down, but we do not have to fall away. That uh, I wrote a article on my website on gitadaily.com on this theme that sometimes our desires may overcome us and we may fall down, but fall away means we become so disheartened that we give up the practice of bhakti itself. So, we may fall down, but we do not have to fall away. Yeah, sometimes our offences can cause us to fall down and then go away. Yeah, but it is very difficult to know at that time, okay, what offence have I committed and how is it happening. So, offences do take our taste away, takes our, take our taste for Krishna Bhakti away and then it becomes easy to, it becomes very difficult to resist the taste of illusion. But then it is best, if we can recognize that I have committed an offence to seek forgiveness and to not presume that if our desires are increasing, they are just because of offences. Because offences are very, it is a, at one level, it is a very strongly stressed point in our scripture, at another level, uh, what exactly comprises an offence can be very difficult to discern. Because during the normal functioning in the world, there will be some interaction which will be unpleasant and for getting some service done, sometimes we have to displease some devotees. Now, that might be considered offence, but that is not like a very serious or a grievous offence. A serious offence is where something is done with a intention of pulling down some devotee, because we do not like their success. So, yes, offence is a Offences can, can make us can make us lose our taste in Krishna Bhakti and make can make us succumb to illusion in a helpless way. But still, if we seek forgiveness and we try to come back, Krishna will help us to come back eventually. So thank you very much, Shri Prabhupada ki jai Gantra Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai jai Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.